Welcome to a very special episode of Back to the City. For the fourth time, I am joined by Chris from Moody Black. We are on the cusp of uh, your tour with Pussifer, which will start on June 9th in Las Vegas and run until July 10th in Seattle. Yep. Right now, we can hear the newest Moody Black release, Flick, yep. uh, which is uh, in a batch of new songs, uh, which, uh, which which we will hear on the on the tour. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, we're going to cover a number of things in this interview. Uh, to some extent, kind of pick up where we left off last time. Uh, some of the main things that we covered in our previous interview were. Um, the emergence of Food House. Uh, so Moody Black, there's always been Mood House. It's the Mood House podcast, yep. the Mood House Music Festival. Yep. Um, and uh, last time, the big new thing that we focused on at the beginning of the interview was uh, the addition of Food House. Oh, yeah. Um, could, and there's all kinds of things that we'll cover. But yeah. let's, so let's dive in. Um, last, last time, we focused on Fuzz. Of course, Fuzz was uh, due to come out um, at, in retrospect, exactly when the pandemic hit. Yep. We focused on that in the previous interview, which is on YouTube if people want to kind of get some, some background. Yeah. Um, could you uh, fill in uh, the Moody Black story in the meantime? So uh, what has been, because obviously we're on, as established, we're on the cusp of um, a big, new chapter yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah what's uh what's been happening in the story in the meantime uh it's weird because there's so much that has happened since i i, <clears throat> I don't know who watches i don't know who's paying attention to what we do doesn't seem like a lot of people in no. the city <laughs> um no so it's weird also to have conversations nowadays before when we first did them i was like all about it about having conversations about Moody Black. Mm. And now I'm like, I mean, I was self-aware then, but I'm more self-aware now. Mm. And sometimes I'm like, why do people care what I have to say? Because I see, even on, on this show, I see artists all the time and we seem so self-important. We want to talk about ourselves. And mm. Mm. So I just want to preface what I'm going to say with that. Like, it's odd to be, to be aware of weirdness of like feeling like I my story is that important that it needs to be shared but then there's also a need to share that story so maybe that's just a weird need in me um but something I just wanted to say right yeah. off the bat just because I was like because it's going to sound so self you know like gratifying I don't know um but we when we did when we did leave off with the f last conversation we had I'm trying to remember it so much has happened since we weren't able to put out our record fuzz in 2020 because the pandemic and we did what everyone else did which was like oh we'll do live streams and, and everyone was doing live streams for a while and then we got to stop doing that because it felt really overexposed to be like oh i'm gonna do this and it seemed kind of lame and you, it was hard to capture what we do through video yeah sound wise yeah. um and as we we're doing all that mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly why, but I had decided to start a business. Um, we had always done pictures of like tacos and like food. It wasn't just tacos. It was like all the food I made because I cook all the time. And so we started to do pop-ups from the house um, as a means of making up income from not being able to work because I also was doing uh, in my real life job behavior therapy for kids and at the time everything was really weird for them too mm -hmm. um, So we we're like, oh, we'll do pop-ups and make tacos for people and as I started chipping away at that I Got all the licensing done <laughs> and all that Just weird like I, I it's so weird because I didn't purposely I Wasn't like I'm gonna do this. Mm. My body just kind of started doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, um so yeah, I started creating. I just started making tacos and people would come pick them up at the house. Got licensed to do it. Got a food manager license. <laughs> put in a business plan for like a catering business. Um, and then we just kept falling into stuff that I couldn't say no to. So I was running every morning when I was making all the taco shop stuff. 
You were going running. Yeah, I was going running. I yeah. was working out a lot. At yeah, the same I remember. Time. It, yeah. I remember you 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 posting about about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a lot of like crazy adjustments with that because it was like the again the pandemic that first six months I feel like everyone was like depressed. Yeah. And I was depressed like everyone else and doing a bunch of unhealthy stuff. And it just became a, to a point where I was like, I got to change this. I don't want to become unhealthy. I mean, I was, already was, but, you know, I didn't want to live that lifestyle. But you had a new commitment to well-being. Yep. It became a more central commitment. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I just committed to that. And that fell in line with, I'm going to do tacos. <laughs> and then yeah. because I was running every morning um, over at Stone Arch Bridge, I, I ran into Caleb that worked at Five Watt Coffee because I was getting coffee every morning. Mm. And we just talked about doing a pop-up at the f coffee shop because I was yep. like, oh, tacos and coffee. It's perfect. Yeah. Original home of yep. food house. Yep. Yep. And then he was like, yeah, let's do it. And then he was like, oh, we have this open space in this other coffee shop, the other location. So I was like, okay, let's do it. Because the deals and the, you know, Caleb really was like, just do it. And it was such a great situation. Mm. That I couldn't say no to it. Cause Running I, into he ran into Caleb on your run. Yeah. So that's so like, yeah. random to th to think. Yeah. Well, it's, it, I mean, it's after the runs because it was at the coffee shop. Oh, okay. The run basically would, would go to the coffee shop. Yeah, it was because of the fact that I had made these changes in my life. Yeah. It just so happened that I ran into this other situation. Yeah. And the other reason we started tacos, honestly, not just because we had to do live streams that that were really frustrating. But because at the time that I started doing it, Moody Black was spinning its wheels. Nobody cared. Nobody cares still. Um, and you just had to be real, really realistic with yourself as an artist on what you, what you offer, what the world's like. And as you get older, you're like, how can I sustain? How can I sustain myself and my family? Yeah. Um, so the whole precipice was built on I got to stop focusing on Moody Black because for me, it's, it was a singular, absolute obsession, and it still is. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But almost, it, it becomes really unhealthy um, mm. when you're focusing on one thing and wanting something so bad that you have no control over. As an artist, we have really no control over if someone's going to like it, if things go viral. Um, and so doing tacos was an idea because I had a lot more control. It got me the ability to focus on something totally different. Mm. Um, and it just went hand in hand with the health, with working out, mm. trying to get in better shape. Then these situations start presenting themselves. And it was opposite than music. I, w I would send out emails all the time about playing shows, cover this song, cover that song. Can we get on this tour? Can we get on that tour? No one ever responds to emails um, with music and MB. Mm -hmm. But for the taco shop, People were just presenting us opportunities that I couldn't say no to. Mm. It was totally opposite. And I knew that somewhere in that synergy, I was like, this is what needs to be done for Moody Black to be successful. Um, what was your, when you were beginning to think along those lines, yep. how did you think that might apply to Moody Black? I didn't even think about it like that. I just yeah. thought it would. So I didn't think like, oh, it correlates. This isn't going to be like, oh, I make tacos and somehow I'm going to have a taco shop and my music's going to play. And it, I, didn't phys I didn't think about how mm. they would actually work together. Mm, mm, mm. It was more just the synergy, the energy of, I know that this feels right. Focusing outside of MB is going to attract, in some way, yeah. opportunities for Moody Black. I just thought that very strongly. You had an awareness that that yeah. would be the case, and then that was very strongly the case. Apparently, it was. But I, at the time, I knew that. I didn't really know it. Yeah. And so when things started manifesting themselves, mm. blew, it blew my mind. And I'm still in shock and awe of like how that worked. Because there is a connection between, there's a strong connection between Food House and then the tour with Christopher. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what is that? <laughs> well, so that's that we'll get we'll get we'll there. there. <laughs> Cuz that's so we were we went ahead and started doing the taco stuff. Yes. And people like the tacos. It was weird. Um I like them. A lot. <laughs> Thank you. 
and people like the food and as obsessive as I am about MB, I became the same way about Food House. Yes. And just working really hard. I believe in working hard, honest, yes. doing everything the right way. So we do that with Food House. It is very good. Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. Um, and so we just started doing it. Like, <laughs> and as we did it, people enjoyed it. We opened up more at the Lindell location. And that's going great. Like, we're just making tacos and it's distracting me from concerning myself with music. Um, and I'm seeing people do live streams like endlessly. And I'm seeing people start touring again when things start opening. Remember, there is like spats where people would tour for like a week and then things mm. would shut down. And then yes, I remember, yeah. And, and uh, it gave me an outsider perspective of the independent musician, which is 99% of musicians, and how damaged the scene is, not Absolutely. just locally, yeah, but for everyone. Mm -hmm. And how we're in this rat race of trying to like attract this to be viral and all these things that artists concern themselves with these days that are so nonsensical mm. and that take all of our energy for a lottery ticket to get access to something that even if we blow up will last two or three years mm. and then, we're, then what? What do you have? Mm. Um, so you could witness the investment, the inordinate amounts of energy being yeah. invested in that yeah. uh, with the system being as it is. Yeah. Uh, and through your commitment to your well-being, uh, part of that was a shifting in your relationship to your musical project. Yeah. Uh, so you had enough distance to just observe without really judging, just observe. Yeah. Okay, the state of affairs. Yep. And then kind of putting that into my lens and my perspective of what I want to do with Moody Black and why I started doing music was like, we've always been interrupters. I've always enjoyed pushing the envelope. We've always been different. And so much of music nowadays is about trying to find those, music's always been like this, but trying to find that little bit of commonality, things that sound like other things that people can get into it. Yeah. But it's become so egregious now because we have to like humiliate and embarrass ourselves on social media. Right. And then we and have over backwards to Yeah, so many artists are doing things just for the sake of increasing visibility to get a leg up in the rat race and, and so you're losing why you're doing the art in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think live shows happen too much because of that too. It's like what are we playing for? Mm. Now, if you're a new musician, new artist, play all the time, play everywhere. But this is for us. Like we're, we're 16, 17 years in at this point. And it doesn't make sense for us to keep doing nonsensical tours mm. um, in small bars and venues, which we love. People take that the wrong way. I love small bars. I love small venues. I get up for shows whether there's no one there or a thousand people. Honestly, I love it. <laughs> I love it more than maybe anybody. But at the same time, I also love what I do as a musician. And it doesn't feel right to just put out music when it's not presented the proper way. Yeah. If people don't care about it. You don't know who's making the money on the shows. Um, yeah. Oftentimes. So it's just taking that into consideration, having all this time not to have access to all of it, just helped me see a little bit better of what I wanted. Yeah. And so that's why I was like midway through the pandemic with everything going on too. I literally, I've been looking for this post, but I literally like a year or so, maybe less ago, said that Moody Black would not play anywhere going mm. forward other than a theater show. I think I said, oh, we're only gonna play massive theaters. Yeah. That's literally what I said. In my brain, I'm thinking, I really thought, I really think that, but I'm like also down to play other stuff as long as I dictate what we play. Mm -hmm. um, as so long it's intentional. Yeah, I set the line in the sand, and then I just started saying no to every opportunity that came through, which none did. Right. But and now I, a bunch of theaters. Yeah, I stopped pursuing it 100%. I stopped making stuff. I stopped pursuing it. Um, and I just, let, I just let it to bed, and I was like, Moody Black will come back when it's ready. And I was not going to be the catalyst of that. And I didn't yeah. have to be. Right. Um, and so that would lead to that Pussifer question. Yeah. Because as we were doing all the food house stuff, mm -hmm. one day I get a message from somebody on Instagram that has been a supporter and, and fan of ours 
I didn't know who she was. Um, and she had shared, either I saw a post or she had shared with me specifically this picture of a whiteboard from a winery that had the list of band names that they play, that they create, they curate playlists for the vines and the grapes that they grow. They play music in these, in these vineyards to grow the wines. Right. Um, and they had been playing our stuff. I was like, okay, cool. Didn't even pay attention to it. Then this person specifically hit me up. I don't remember what came first, but she was like, um, I think this is when she said it. She said, I'm who she is. I won't necessarily say the exact specifics, uh, but she was basically Maynard's wife. Mm -hmm. um, Maynard Keenan from Tool, Lucifer. Wife, and she had been following. I had no idea who she was. Nor do I really, that doesn't, I've never been a Tool fan, never been a Pucifer fan. I've heard the name Maynard here and there, but I didn't know anything, so I was like, okay, cool. Perfect circle. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not a perfect <laughs> circle. Sean loved all those people. Oh, really? Um, yeah, big fan. Um, he'll play it down like he wasn't. Sean but, um, Mendel um, in Moody Bank. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the, the, she hit me up and was like, someone's going to come to the food house, and like they're going to get merch, and... It's an agent that's coming to check out the food house, and I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was something like that. Yeah. And and then had mentioned like in passing about for like touring or whatever it is. And I was like, okay, whatever. I don't like whatever. Like you hear that stuff as a musician all the time. Like, yeah, like this agent is going to come to our place. And so one day we're working. It's like Saturday morning, and someone comes. And it's a, an agent slash vineyard w worker that works there that handles some of the business for Merkin Vineyards, which is Maynard's vine Vineyards. Um, came in and just got food and talked to us for like an hour, bought a bunch of merch for everybody. I guess Maynard wanted stuff. Um, loved the food. <coughs> and then started talking to us about their tours and their shows that they do. Mm. I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and then and then was like, um, if you get, you know, he was like, so we have this tour coming up in, this, in the summer. And this was like a year out. I was like, okay, whatever. Again, pandemic, it's still, stuff isn't. And uh, he was like, you're going to hear from an agent. We'll give you a call in a few weeks. And again, I'm like, whatever. Like, it's not, I didn't even... I'm thinking right now this is complete not true. Um, and then in a couple of weeks, I get a call from LA. And it's uh, the management for Pucifer and Tool, mm -hmm. the manager. And then pretty much just offers us uh, a slot to open for Pucifer. And um, it's weird because <laughs> we, and this is after we've been do doing tacos forever. Yeah. Um, I dedicated like my entire life to MB. Yes. And um, and then doing all the taco stuff was with MB in mind. And some of the it's hardest. Still, it still is. Yeah. Moody Black. It's Moody Black Food House. Yeah, and it was the hardest work in my life. And Food House is still hard. It's hard work. And so. To be working for so long in the music world and never have somebody really reach out and give us an opportunity of that magnitude that we've been searching for, just to get it, but I'm sitting in my car and talking to the management. It was, a, it was like an emotional thing, talking about it now, but yeah. So it was validating um, because, you know, you, you know us, we, we exist so much in having to pump ourselves up all the time because no one does it for us. <laughs> so to get that validation and that opportunity was a huge deal for me personally and for Moody Black. And so yeah, so that's, once that happened and it was real, it's still not real till I'm there because I'm thinking of 10,000 ways it can go to hell. Mm -hmm. um, with pandemic still there kind of, you never know. So I'm very skeptical still. <laughs> I'm always like, but it's all going good. Um, yeah, so once that happened, 
it just blew my mind of like all these opportunities. I said yes to everything with the food house. And here we are in this opportunity. Yeah, and and this opportunity being invited to go on tour with Christopher, the fact that it comes about through someone coming to Food House uh -huh. and getting merch and eating the food, mm -hmm. that's such an interesting it's unbelievable. part of the story, isn't it? It's unbelievable. Why, um, and so, and then you, you were, you were saying in, until it didn't seem, it still didn't seem real, but then, no. um, then you, you went out to, to see Maynard, is that correct? Yeah. So, so at this, at the time, once the agent got there, yeah. around there, it was like eight, seven, eight months ago, me and Maynard just started talking. He hits me up on Instagram and we just build this funny, odd relationship online. <laughs> Again, to me, he, I, I'd never seen him like a, a huge, I know he's a huge deal to people. Yeah. But to me, I never was into it. So to me, it's just like a normal, I, I think it's actually better for me because it's like, I don't have this mystique. Mm, yeah. I mean, I love Maynard. He's, all, he's been nothing but awesome to us. Um, but since, since having a relationship with Maynard. Yeah, you, and, you, and most you, of our talking revolves yeah. around food. Right. So he loves to cook. So we always, we're always talking about, very rarely are we talking about, we barely talk about music. I, like, I don't even know if he knows what we sound like kind of stuff. I know he does, cause he, but we don't talk about it. We talk about food, yeah. business. He sends me weird pictures of him making pasta mm. uh, and his espresso machine. He's really proud of that. Um, and I would like send him pictures of some of the tacos we're making. Yeah. Um, and so we'll, we'll get to Sana in a minute. We'll bridge some of this stuff. Um, Sana being the song, uh, sorry, Sana, Sana, Sana being the record yeah. that, uh, was created 2008 to 2010, 2010, 2010 2011. 2011. Yeah. And yeah. then it's just been re-released. Mm -hmm. And so... <coughs> The reason I bring that up is because the, the other fascinating part is that we're from Arizona. We're from Phoenix. Mm. And we traveled here initially to be a part of the music scene in Minneapolis. Um, I mean that every way I say it. Um, but it's interesting. And then we went across the world and did tours. <laughs> and then we do the tacos. And we travel all over the place looking for opportunities, only for it to come right from our backyard in Jerome, where the, the vineyard is and where Maynard lives. Mm. I find that also another weird, crazy, otherworldly coincidence of yeah. like, we went everywhere and, and right in our backyard is where our biggest opportunity is yeah, coming from. Where the grapes have been listening to Moody Black in the meantime. Yeah, where it's from, which makes sense. You should grow grapes to Moody Black in Arizona. Why not? <laughs> Um, and that was, um, so I'm just making sure I have this detail right. So Maynard's wife had been enjoying Moody Black and was responsible for Moody Black being played to the grapes yep. before there was Food House. Yep. And uh, I believe it was before Food House. Yeah. And so, and so she was aware of you. Yep. And, c and you were vaguely aware of this person without knowing who she was, yep. uh, following, engaging on social media. Yep. Didn't um, know who she was at all. So, yeah, that's so interesting that there was this, uh, that she presumably enjoyed Moody Black yep. uh, just for the music and thought that it would help the grapes grow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Prior yep. to there being this business and food yep. commitment yep. that now, rather than music, is like the basis of your friendship yep. with Maynard. Yep, which is really weird. Yeah. And we'll probably without the food house, maybe they don't make the leap of, hey, you want to go on tour? Right. Because Maynard's really into, I think he's really, I, I'm just assuming he's really into people that are doing a lot of other things other than just music. And I think that that's so important. Um, for artists and musicians to remember, and this coming from someone that was hard-headed, oh, musician, I'm an artist, whatever. Um, like, it's very important to have other things in your life, especially that can sustain you right now. 
because music music ain't it. Yeah, hence the commitment to wellness. Um, commitment to wellness. Yeah, and 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 other ways to use your art because we use a lot of the ethos from Moody Black with the food spot. Yeah, whether it's image the imagery or the way that we go about things, but. The Pussifer record that the tour is promoting is Existential Reckoning. Yep. And I feel that there's, with Pussifer, there's always been reflection, uh, serious and kind of whimsical, interesting kind of com combination of those two things yep. on the existential significance of music. And as I was listening to Existential Reckoning and thinking, yeah, there is a reckoning with the existential significance of music and the lack of appreciation of it. It's yep. like in the opening track to Existential Reckoning, Bread and Circus. I'm familiar with the songs. I've been yeah. listening to them, yeah. Here we are in the middle of our Existential Reckoning. Uh, long ago, we all traded regretfully, abdicated our voice and our light. Mm -hmm. And I just, that, that was a window into thinking, for me, a window into thinking about the connection. There is a strong one, I think, between um, the ethos of Christopher, especially on that record, yep. and Moody Black, yep. and this idea of abdicating our voice and our light, yep. and the focus on it being our, as opposed to, um, I think in this band, you know, Maynard is able to reflect on, um, to, to use all of this artistry, to reflect from a kind of human perspective on uh, the lack of um, scope for living creatively uh, that humans generally have. Yep. And then to be uh, a in the spotlight, a performer, perhaps especially to be <laughs> Maynard from Tool. Yeah, especially. <laughs> and, uh, and then to be reckoning existentially with, like, what does it mean to be a performer, to be s someone who has the privilege and the ability yep. to harness this creativity and publicly be seen as this, but then the kind of discomfort that you've been reflecting on today and in the previous few interviews yep. that we've had on um, the egoism, you know, just the artist thinking of themselves as an artist and of my story, I'm the artist, it's, it matters more than everybody else's. Yep. Um, I think the song Red and Circus yep. is on the alienation uh, of like the people who don't think of themselves as, as performers and artists and have stories that matters. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, it, we, the paradox, trade it all for nothing more than concessions, fireworks, pageantry and glitter, gladiators and jesters, just entertainers. Yep. So there's this awareness there uh, that people come to the big show to see like the grand performer, yep. uh, pageantry and entertainers. Yep. And the kind of performance art aspects of Persifer is kind of simultaneously give like satisfying that craving yep. and drawing awareness to what's going on yep. uh, to kind of make a point about what creativity is, not just for the great creator, you know. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, and, and Maynard, knowing him, thinks <laughs> way deeply yeah. about uh, the Pusifer stuff in particular. Um, I can, I can tell that. It's very purposeful. I believe why we are a part of this particular tour. It is. Um, because oddly enough, we're the one band that would fit there right now at this time and the only one. Yeah. Um, and I don't even know if he's that aware yet of it. <laughs> and that's part of my preparation of like, wait till you see us play. <laughs>